today I'm here to talk about warm season vegetables and I'm going to I'm going to cover what that is as opposed to cool season vegetables. But before I start, I want to introduce myself. My name is Ruth Ostrow. Um, I'm a lifelong gardener, been hanging out with my grandfather when I was little, and, uh, and then I grew up in the Bay Area. I've been in California all my life, and um, I went to UC Berkeley. I have a degree in forestry, so I'm not just about little plants, I'm big plants too. And, uh, and then I took a bunch of horticulture classes at the American River College and became a master gardener in 2005 with the County of Sacramento. And I'm still a volunteer. I work, um, I spend most of my volunteer hours out at the Fair Oaks Horticulture Center, which is at the corner of Madison and Fair Oaks uh, behind the library. If you haven't been there, I highly recommend it. It'd be a great follow-up to this talk because you can see during our workshops, you can have you know hands-on, all the master gardeners, different areas uh, of the Horticulture Center. There's a an extensive vegetable area and if uh, if you're interested in just vegetables you'll be happy but if you like other gardening uh, other crops then you'll be happy there too. I'll go ahead and get started. It's it's always nice I think to kind of know who your audience is so I'm, I'm just curious how many of you um, are new gardeners? Okay great good um, and then how many of you have been gardening for many years? A number of yeah I guess that would be the other half of the people. So the way this talk is arranged, I'm going to talk a little bit about, as I said, um, what the difference is between warm season and cool season vegetables, and then uh, why there's not a clear demarcation uh, among all those things. Um, before, before I start with that, I want, to, I want to bring your attention to the handouts that you have up in the corner uh, here. There is a website. Most of my handouts are from uh, the University of California Ag and Natural Resources. And, uh, and this website here is the Sacramento Master Gardener website. If you click on that website and you go to the menu bar across the top, there'll be a section that says publications. And you click on that and you'll have access to just about any information in a publication you want, including all of the ones I have here today. So this one is called Vegetable Gardening 101. And it is, it is very thorough. I highly recommend this, especially if you're a new gardener. But even if you're not, I read through it again and I always find something in here. Uh, one of my favorite things, and we'll talk a little bit about crop rotation, but the last page breaks out all our kind of favorite plants by plant families. And when we talk about plant rotation, like don't plant tomatoes in the same place every single year in a row, we're not just talking about tomatoes, we're talking about things that are in the family, tomato family, like potatoes and um, peppers, eggplant, those kinds of things. So this is a great resource and I recommend that you get on the website and, and um, take, a, take a look at that. So um, the warm season vegetables we were talking about, warm season vegetables need warm temperatures and warm soil. So, and not, we're not talking hot, I mean warm. Um, so 65 degrees to 95 degrees, you get over 95 and you probably have noticed your tomatoes stop pollinating, the, the pollen dries up and it becomes a problem. Cool season, the average temperature is um, like 55 to 75. So you can see there's a little bit of overlap in that, in those two. And so what I wanna focus on is timing and, um, and temperature. And I think the best way to start doing that is to have you pull up the handout, this one here, the environmental horticulture notes for Sacramento vegetable planting schedule. And it's a two pager and the, actually I think it's a three, no it's two. Um, and it has, I've, I've gone ahead and kind of marked the two columns for, for where we are now, which is March and April. We're almost into April. And so, um, I want you to look down on the side where all the crops are and you'll note that the warm season crops are things like um, beans and chard, um, corn, cucumbers, eggplant, melons, okra, uh, and then if you turn the page there's um, peppers and soybeans and summer squash and winter squash, tomatoes, watermelon. Those are kind of our, our basic crops that we grow here in our area in the summer. Maybe not all of them but a lot of people grow a lot of those. And, and you'll notice that for the warm season crops, we're looking at, if you go to like April and you look down, 
where the second week of April kind of has a dent in it and then you have the dark bar that starts there, that is when you want to start planting your warm season vegetables. Unless, of course, you plant, and, and you would, if you're going to, for example, plant um, tomatoes, you're going to want to start the seeds six to eight weeks before you're going to get them in the ground. So um, you could plant tomato seeds directly when the soil's really warm, but it's, um, but you may not have a long enough growing season to really get a crop. So it's, it's kind of nice to get a jump on. For those, for those of you who are just coming, please take both handouts. And we're referring right now to this one, which is um, the planting schedule. So, um, so I was wondering, I, I think since we just mentioned, since I just mentioned seeds, starting seeds, how many of you grow your plants from seeds? Not very many. Okay, that's, that's great. So I have some, um, some kind of thoughts on that. I think one is when I first started gardening, it was kind of a scary thing. There's all these different seeds and um, what do I buy and they don't come up or they, I don't know, I might not have success with them. The, the thing with growing from seed is it's not hard. There are, just a few, there are just a few things to remember. And I have a few tricks that I use always and, the, and it, it just guarantees a, a good seed starting. And I'll, um, I'll go over some of that now. So if you're gonna start, um, if you're gonna start seeds for tomatoes or uh, peppers, it's a little bit late, but it's not too late. Um, what you wanna do is you want to get some kind of a seedling mix, and I'm not, a, I'm not um, pushing this brand. I'm just saying that if you are going to get, a, for starting seeds, you wanna look on the back and make sure that there, uh, there isn't a lot of um, material in it, like manures and um, various, that you want, it, you want it pretty plain, like maybe a peat moss and uh, perlite, which are those little white balls of, um, and, and really not much else because the, new, the seeds do not need to have nutrients in their initial soil. They, until they, when they first come up, there's a lot of food so resources in the seed. They come up and they can grow for a while like that. And then once they're up, you can start giving them some sort of diluted, uh, very diluted fertilizer. So uh, inoculants are oftentimes, not always, I don't usually use them, but um, they're oftentimes used for things in the pea family, peas and beans. They tend to um, promote more nitrogen fixing, which is, if you, were to, if you were to pull up a bean plant and look at the roots, you would see a lot of uh, white dots that look like perlite growing on, on them, nodules. And those are actually uh, nitrogen nodules. The beans and peas are really unique in that they can take nitrogen from the air in their leaves bring it down to their roots and produce, um, produce these nodules. And uh, in fact, they're a really popular, what they call a cover crop. So in between your regular cropping, and you cut it, you wanna cut and turn in these uh, cover crops before they start to bloom, because then they produce their own fertilizer and they're gonna start using it. So you'll have less in your soil. Um, so I, I wanted to tell you, this is a, this is a premium potting soil, premium. Um, this, all, again, is not a brand I'm promoting. I'm just telling you that on the back, the ingredients in this are a lot more than what was in the seed starting packet, which was two things. This one has peat moss core, which is coconut, a product from coconut, pumice, recycled forest products, rice hulls, bark finds, composted chicken manure, feather meal, dried poultry litter, bat guano, kelp meal, worm castings, dolomite, oyster shells, and alfalfa meal which is great if you're growing things in a pot. Lots of good, uh, a good in your soil for your pot, but not good particularly to start your seeds. That's not to say you can't have success with this. You can. It's just, it's just not as good as starting with something that's more minimal. The way I like to start my seeds is I have, I have a couple of key things. Uh, I'll start my tomato seeds and my pepper seeds and, and any, uh, any seeds that I'm not going to directly put in the ground, and I'll, I'll talk about those in a minute, I just start them inside, I start them in my garage or my house, um, and, I, and I save containers. I like these containers. I like the lettuce, the ones you get like $5 thing of lettuce, plastic. They fit a couple of 
little six packs. You don't have to use six packs. You can use yogurt containers or whatever. I fill this with the seed starting material, kind of rough it up, put the seed, couple of seeds in each one. I, I, wet, I wet it first. I wet the potting, the, the mixture first because sometimes uh, if they don't have what they call a wetting agent added, uh, it'll, the water will kind of run off. It won't actually soak in. So you'll think you've watered them and, and if you kind of look under the soil, it's still kind of dry. So wet it first, fluff it up a little, put your seeds in. Uh, usually you plant seeds like two, two or three times the diameter of the seed that is what you cover it with soil. Um, for little tiny seeds, I just put them in the top and then I water them in. And the way, what I use to water, I have a couple of things. I'm all about like recycling. <laughs> so uh, on my, in my seed trays, I save bottles and I put holes in the top. Uh, I use an uh, ice pick that I heat on my stove and it goes in really easily. Also, uh, milk cartons work really well. And this, this has a lid that's got a lot of holes in it too. And, it, and the, the reason I use these is that they're, they're gentle. When you water, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't make the plant all broken and messed up like if you were to use a hose or something on them. So, and then I, um, I usually, not always, uh, but for warm season crops, I'll use um, a heat mat. And I don't know if you, are you familiar with heat mat? Anybody uses heat mats here? Okay, a heat mat, uh, usually most, I have a couple of them. This is the small one because it fit in my box better, but uh, they're usually, uh, for the amount of seeds I grow, I have a bigger one. And what it does is you plug it in and it warms up uh, about 10 degrees warmer than what's happening like if you have it in your garage and your garage is 50 then it's going to be like 60 to 70 degrees on the heat mat and uh and seeds need a certain um a certain amount of uh, soil i i think that this the other handout i gave you had to do with soil um temperature is that okay so so if you um if you turn to the second page and look at um at the top of it, it gives a kind of a, an intro about tomatoes, where it says um, tomatoes germinate best between, I think it says 65 and 85 degrees. So if you were to, um, if you were to, to have your tomato seedling in a, in a pot or in the ground at a temperature that was more higher than that or lower than that, you would have, uh, it would take a lot longer, how many days it would take to get to, to germinate, which is when the, the seed breaks open and becomes a plant. So if you, if you look at that, and you look at, if you're seeing a, on the chart, you're looking at days uh, that it takes. If you look at the tomato, if you go down from the 65, 75, 85 area, which is an optimal area for tomatoes, you see they'll come up in roughly six to eight days in your, in your little seed thing. If you plant them at, you know, higher, you're looking at uh, more days for it to come up. If, yeah, and then lower, yeah. 42 days for it, to, if it comes up at all after it sits there in a wet seed thing. So if you're not having success with seeds, that may be one of the problems is that the, the temperature may not be right. So I wanted you to have this. I think another thing that's really important is um, we have a seed. The, these are kind of all over the internet. This is from a, a, a seed catalog. Like, for example, like one of these. And I have these out so you can get an idea of what sorts of companies sell seeds. But they, each of these, um, it, each, each seed has a certain amount, and I can pass this around, has a certain amount of time that it's actually viable. And after that, you take in a chance. And the best way to find out if your seeds are viable is to take, uh, take a few of them out of your packet and, um, and kind of sprinkle them on a damp paper towel, kind of roll it up. You've maybe done this before, put it in a baggie, and uh, come back and check it in a week. And you can see if you have like 10 seeds and only five of them germinated. You probably you have a 50% germination rate, which means that when you start your seeds, you probably want to put a few extra in your little seed packets because not all of them are going to come up. So yes. Would you recommend doing that for seeds? I I would if you're if you're outside the window of what uh, 
of your seed viability, I, I definitely would. I, I know onions are, are one of those plants that they say a year or two. I actually have onion seeds that I've been growing well for three and four years. So it's, it's just, you just take a chance if you're outside the window, but it doesn't mean it won't work. And tomatoes, tomatoes can uh, last quite a while, uh, as do um, what we call brassicas. So that would be crops like broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, kale, those kinds of things generally last quite a few years. Um, so, so yeah. It's yeah. soil temperature, not air temperature. Air soil temperature. So, and I'm glad you brought that up because um, I, check, um, I check my soil temperature outside. Uh, also, there are seeds that you, you, ha you really should plant directly in the ground. Like you, you shouldn't go to Green Acres or anywhere else and buy a six pack of corn. Just not a good idea. Much better success at germination and growth and health if you plant it directly when the soil is at the temperature it recommends. So you don't want to plant corn now because the soil temperature is around 50 degrees or so, um, which would be really good for lettuce and um, some other types of crops that have a cooler thing. Anyway, what you would do is, these are two different um, brands of, of uh, soil thermometer. I'm gonna pass this one around and you're welcome to, I, I think it'd be okay. Jace, is it okay if they stick it in? Yeah, you can, can I ask if you have a meat thermometer, would it work? I wouldn't use a meat thermometer. I, the, the range is just, uh, it's just not made for it. Different, yeah. What about yeah. just a digital? Oh, like, um, I, you know, you might have luck with that. I, I don't know. I haven't tried them. To, to tell you the truth, I, if, if I had a meat thermometer and I wanted to try it, I would make sure I knew what the temperature was and then try the meat one. But, you know, if we're talking, they're pretty low. Like meat thermometers are pretty higher, you know, like, because right. you want your meat at... Uh, You're at 350, this is all we have. Yeah, you'll see what, yes. Are those expensive and where do you get them? Um, I just get my stuff usually on Amazon, um, but I'm sure you could go directly to the company. And this is VG? It's Therm. Is that a brand? VG, VG yes, yeah, it's a brand. I like that one. You can get them on Amazon. I don't think it's the only brand. I like this one too. The reason this is longer is that I also have a compost pile at my house and this will stick really far in and I can see how warm my compost pile is. So when, when I put seeds in, you want to put them in the sun? You want to put them in shade? Shade is fine. They don't need, well, I shouldn't say that. There are some seeds that like to have some light and and they're usually very 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 fine seeds like uh, chamomile for example um, but I, I have good success with chamomile it, it coming up in the dark too so um, yeah I, I think you don't need light until the plant is up and starting to produce its own food so it's doing a photosynthesis which is what they call it you know when it starts to make its own food and supply that to the roots up until that point in time, the seed has enough of pretty much everything. But once they're up, then, and I didn't talk about this, once, once they're actually up, um, I, take, I take the lid off. A lot of my mine are cut this way, so I can actually just remove the lid. And then I put them in a sunny window. Most, for me, I have a, a grow lights, um, and those can be just a fluorescent bulb in your workshop or uh, you can buy those online. Some of them are pricey. Uh, they're, they emit, some of them emit a full spectrum of light, like if it was outside, and some are like if you just used your fluorescent bulb. They seem to work pretty well, actually. But you, you, they definitely need light once they're up, light and, and moisture. Don't let them dry out. Don't let the seeds dry out. That's why you have the cover on, some kind of cover, uh, because if the seed, if the medium dries out, well, it's um, germinating, your seeds will die. Even if they've started, they just, they just can't do it. And it doesn't get moldy? I don't, I don't shut it tightly. I have had mold problems when I do shut it tightly, but um, I leave it open. Sometimes I'll even put a pencil in, just get, get a little air. But this way it doesn't evaporate so fast and it, you know, it stays moist. So some people um, are proponents of water from the bottom only, like they put the water in a pan and then they put, they, you know, they make sure the seedlings are, the soil is moist and they planted them and they've watered them and then they water from then on in the bottom. Um, I, I don't do that, but, um, but I think it's a good idea. I just don't, I don't have a problem with it. 
See, see how this is like not shut? That's okay, but, but this is not. Could you repeat that? How often do you tend them? How often, the question is, how often do I tend my seedlings? Um, I look at them, uh, I'll, put the, I'll put the seeds in, in the container, and then on the packet, um, the, the seed packets have a ton of information, and they will tell you when to expect them to come up, and uh, how long it's going to take until uh, from seedling, uh, from seed to, to planting. Uh, so this one says, this is a bean. You would plant this directly in the ground, not in a six pack in your house, because you wait until the soil's warm. Days to emerge, six to 12 days. So I would probably not look at that, for that bean until maybe day five or so, day five or six. I wouldn't expect it. And, and depending on the soil uh, warmth, if it, what side of the scale, it's, it is. Um, and it also tells, it's kind of interesting, it's got a lot of information on the back. Um, seedling depth, so bean seed, these bean seeds are roughly a half an inch, and they're telling you to, to seed, the seed depth is, a, is an inch. So it's, you're covering it like, again, by the, the size of it. So it's, you know, again, and you could, you could even do it a little bit deeper. Um, row spacing, if you need to thin it, and then to maturity. This one, this particular type, uh, this is a uh, bush bean called Provider, and it stays to maturity of 50. So when you plant it, it comes up, and then it will be 50 days. You should be able to pick, if the weather's good. <laughs> Everything's about the weather. Yeah, yeah. weather and, and watering. Um, I did want to, I did want to touch on um, watering also. I think it's a really important point. There's a, there's a couple of ways once your plants are in your garden uh, to, you know, to, to make sure that they have good water. Um, one of them is a drip irrigation. A, a lot of people use that. Uh, you could also use soaker hoses. That keeps the moisture. If you look in these boxes, the water district boxes, all of these are using, is this a, uh, Jace, is this a Netafin type pro product, inline drip? sort of yes. so the this tubing here if you you can see some of it's exposed has a dripper inside the tube so they're they're inline drip irrigation um, it you don't have to do that they're very efficient um, another thing p some people do is they'll take um, you know take a bottle and put a couple holes in the bottom cut off the top and then they just fill their hose so that way you buried it and that way the water slowly comes out next to the plant. Um, other people use terracotta type pots with a similar idea. They're called Oyas. You may have heard of that, Oya pots. Um, so there's um, also one thing that's important is like if you're near a box that ha looks like it's dry on top, if you start to um, take your fingers and dig down, you know, three or four inches, it's going to be damp. And, and just because it looks dry doesn't mean you need to water it. You don't want to overwater. Also, vegetables generally don't like to be watered from the top, except if you have things like aphids or um, spider mites, that kind of thing, a small infestation, you can take a strong hose and spray them off in the morning. Make sure it's like you want your plant to get dry by the evening. You don't want it overnight and kind of invite fungal diseases and things like that. Um, so does it water in the morning? I, you can. Water, if it's inline drip, it doesn't matter because it's not getting on the leaves. It's just a, if you're watering overhead, uh, it, which I'd say, you know, it, it's really not the best way. You get a lot of uh, evaporation, so a lot of it doesn't go to the plant. Um, yeah, it's I just. Usually like I water, uh, when I water from the top, I water at night, but after sunset. Yeah, it's, pro it's better in the morning, but if you're having success with it, you know. Um, you may be, uh, you I may be, with the heat. yeah, <laughs> right, okay. yeah, 15 degrees, nothing. oh, nobody, no, no, <laughs> plants, you don't, yeah, you wilt, they wilt, everything wilts, and that's another thing, too, if you see, like, squash are particularly prone to this, uh, they will, at midday, when, in our Sacramento sunshine, those, those guys will just, they'll look like they need water 
that's kind of people go, oh, it's wilting. But that's not the case. The, the case is that they're, they're closing up underneath their leaves. They have, an, uh, they have little openings under the leaves called stomata that open and close to allow uh, moisture in and out. And they, they close up and they hunker down until it cools off. And a lot of times, either the next morning or in the evening, when you go out and do your water, uh, they'll, be, they'll, perk, they'll be, have perked back up again. So check with your water meter. We have water meters um, for giveaways over here at the table. They're really cute little frogs. Um, please help yourself to a moisture meter. This is um, a moisture meter I really like. Uh, this particular brand has been a, a really um, good for me. It's, it's very consistent. And so if, if you stick it, it's very easy to use too. You stick it in and it does like the soil temperature, only it's water. Um, and yeah, I'll pass this around too. Uh, I know it, on the package it says to take out and wipe it off after every use, but can't you just leave this in there? I wouldn't leave it in, no. I wouldn't leave it in. <laughs> so yeah, so if you haven't gotten one of these and if there are enough, there's another one here. If um, In the soil? Um, if things really start to look a little droopy, I'll check it, but I have drip irrigation and generally speaking, my plants do pretty well. With tomatoes, tomatoes are, um, are pretty much self-pollinating. The, the flower parts are all pretty self-contained. So the pollen, the female and male parts of the flower are inside. Like if you're growing a greenhouse tomato and you don't have access to bees or any kind of insects at all uh, to, to even, or wind, to move it around, uh, they'll, people will come by with like, they'll shake the plant or they'll use an electric toothbrush and just kind of, kind of mess up the pollen inside. Um, there are resources that, uh, that talk on, that we have on the Master Gardener website that talk about how, um, how things are pollinated. Like, is it a wind pollinated like corn? Uh, is it uh, insect pollinated uh, like, what would be insect pollinated? Well, you, actually, Peppers, uh, yeah, so insects, including the peaches, are insect pollinated. Yes. So we had this peach, the flowers that come out like in February, weren't we? If they, got, if they got rain or too cold, it could damage the flowers too. But there are bees out. I've seen some. Not, you know, it's a little early. They don't like, they don't like the cold. And they don't like it when it's 115. <laughs> They're very finicky. What are some good, uh, kind of like, neighboring plants to put around in, uh, plants that you need bugs to pollinate? Oh, yeah. I, um, so the question is, what can you uh, plant with your plants to in increase pollinators? I'll, so I'll tell you, uh, right here, if you look at this broccoli, uh, they've let this go to seed. This is actually, a, even though we're going to pull it out, these have already produced pollen. That down there at the end, some kind of a mustard uh, looking thing, the yellow flowers. Uh, those are very attractive to pollinators. And, and when we say pollinators, we're not just talking about bees. We're talking about other insects too. Even, even a fly, if it lands on it and it goes to another flower, will pollinate it. Um, you can pollinate too if you take a, like a little paintbrush and go from flower to flower to, on another plant. So a lot of ladybugs. What's that? Yarrow? So the yellow yarrow? Yeah, yeah, this yarrow is a... Um, Yes, yarrow is a good pollinating supporting plant. This has, as she noticed, this has a lot of ladybugs on it. This is a really good ladybug season. I have tons of ladybugs in my, in my garden right now, so I'm really happy. <laughs> so, yeah. So, oh, I wanted to draw your attention too um, while I'm thinking of it. So there are um, gardening calendars that are out uh, that uh, are produced Especially, I like the, um, well, of course, I'm partial to the Sacramento County Master Gardeners um, and it, because it's, it's a great resource and it covers a lot of what we talked about today. It also has the planting chart in the back and it's broken down by um, warm season and cool season, which is a little different than what you have there. Uh, but I also like, this is the Placer County Master Gardener um, calendar. And one thing that's kind of fun about it it's got things on, on different days that you can do. Um, and I'll pass those around. 
two. Um, want to make sure things that are passed around come back? <laughs> Do you want to? You can buy them uh, at any of the Master Gardener events at the Ferrox Horticulture Center. You can buy them online. They, um, we have, I think, they, I think there's, they may still be selling them online, but it'll tell where you can get them or who you can call uh, to get them. Oh, uh, I saw when I was at, I don't know if I'm pointing the right way, at Green Acres the other day. We have them at uh, nurseries and uh, plant supply places too. They had a bunch of them there at, at the San Juan, uh, on San Juan. Just, oh, okay. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so we talked about a, a little bit about starting seeds. Um, starting seeds in the ground is very similar as far as timing. You've got the timing chart. You uh, would check the soil temperature. And really, um, if it's warm enough for you to really comfortably sit on, it's probably warm enough for you to put a... a summer veggie in because you know if it's too cold for you to just stay there it's going to be too cold for a tomato uh, which we usually plant on um, at the end of uh, April usually depending on the weather um, I think we <laughs> a lot of the master gardeners say Fred Hoffman is one of our lifetime master gardeners he has a, a, a radio show KFBK uh, farmer Fred and he also um, has a, a blog that he has uh, online. And his birthday, I think, is the 28th of, of April. And he's big, you know, plant tomatoes on my birthday kind of guy. <laughs> so, but anyway, that's a, that's a good window right in there. It's usually warm enough for that. Are there any questions about about that? Soil. Soil. Clay. Clay soil. Clay soil. Sandy soil. Um, amend with um, compost, um, organic material. Just put. And just keep putting it in, and it'll. This um, organic material is just—it's um, the answer, just the answer to it. The, uh, something people confuse uh, with um, with putting compost in is is mulch. So we have uh, here they've top dressed. They put a mulch here, which is these are uh, like little bark, wood chippy kind of bark, uh, and, and they put this on the top of the soil. Because they are not, uh, they are not decomposed enough to actually mix into your soil. What will happen is your soil will be robbed of uh, nitrogen as it tries to break these down. But compost is already broken down, and these boxes here are, are prime examples of like they've added a lot of organic compost, at the top, not compost in, mulch on top, and mulch does a couple of things. I sh I didn't mention this, but the mulch helps to keep not not just the water in uh, you put a two like a two inch layer of mulch make sure it's thick enough especially in our hot summers to uh, to protect the roots um but it it yeah it keeps the soil cooler too so your plants who want to grow at an optimum soil temperature uh you, you keep that soil temperature really nice i have um blueberries i grow blueberries in my yard um oh, southern okay <laughs> we can talk after um but blueberries are similar to azaleas in that they have a very um, shallow root uh, area. And so they, uh, they really, their roots can't, they just can't handle the heat. But if you put a layer of like four inches of mulch around, you don't want, with a woody plant, you don't want to have the mulch on the crown of the, of the plant. I mean, the part where it, the roots start in the, the brand, you know, the main trunk where, if you uh, cover too much of it, like a tree, if you plant it too deeply, it'll die. Um, so you don't want to uh, put too much mulch. You keep it away from the wood, the woody part. But, uh, but for vegetables, you can go just up next to them. They, and, and I use all kinds of mulch in my yard. I have chickens, so I use composted chicken manure. Hot chicken manure is very, very tough on plants. It's just, it's hot. It, it's hot, it, and that just, it burns. It's got a high nitrogen, and it'll, it'll really burn. Um, I use straw, um, I use um, grass clippings, I don't have a lot of grass, but if I have grass I, I use that too. Leaf, uh, leaves in the fall, one thing you need to worry about, with, not worry, but think about, consider with um, leaves is that if you, you get a, a too thick, a thick layer, they can prevent water from actually going through it. It makes like a, you know, saran wrap kind of thing going on. And, so you just want to make sure it's kind of broken up. 
but yes. Um, if you're starting the seed in the ground though, how long do you wait until you put the bulbs on top? I would wait until it's up. Uh, uh, what I do is I put, to, and this is, this is interesting because a lot of times you plant seeds in the ground and they don't come up. Or they come up and the birds get them and you don't see the birds get them and you think they didn't come up. That happens a lot. But I put, um, I use something called a floating row cover. Has any of you ever heard of that? It's, um, it's kind of a, a woven white material. It comes in different thicknesses. And, for, uh, and it's good for frost protection in the winter. It's also really good for, um, for shade in, in the summer. It's also good to keep that moisture that you need, like you're, you're, essentially, you're essentially doing this with your outside plant. When you put a floating, floating row cover in, you're keeping the moisture in. Um, so yeah, so then when it comes up, then. So. Yeah. Would like that nylon tarp mesh material work as well? I wouldn't use a nylon tarp because it doesn't breathe. You, would, you, you might have this whole thing of like we were talking earlier about getting fun, fungus on or some sort of mold on the soil. And I actually did have that problem recently. I had, uh, I get those chickens, rotisserie chickens at Costco. They make a great little thing to start seeds in. And I put, uh, I turned it over. So it had drain holes on the bottom. You know, I had little holes on the white, on the clear part. I turned it over. I put some seeds material in there. I planted some seeds, and I put the top on tight. And the next morning, I came out, and the thing was covered with mold. So that's why you really need to get some air in there and not do them really tight. But a floating row cover won't do that because it breathes. You get the air in there. Is it cotton? It's not cotton. Um, I do use burlap um, bags also. Like I got a, I had a. Uh, someone gave me a bunch of old burlap bags and I cut them up and I put them and they're they work great um, too it's it's not cotton it's a poly kind of a woven poly material it's, yeah and you can buy it at any nursery you can buy it online um, oh here we have some yeah, oh good out here during the winter over the lemon tree and, yeah. yeah do you want to pass it around yeah. Yeah. people can it's see that wet, and and you can uh, oh it's dripping yeah. it's dripping and and it lasts from year to year. Um, I've found even with my citrus trees, this is like a little diversion here, but I, I put some kind of either stakes or I'll open up an old tomato cage that's, not, it doesn't even have to be as tall as a tree, just like here, and then wrap it with something around. I also use um, Christmas lights, the ones that are, get warm that you can hardly buy anymore. And, and also they have a, a spray that's called, um, well, I think that, I'm not sure what the generic name for it is, but there's a brand called Cloud. And all of these, and, and if you spray it, it's, it's a, an anti-transparent. Um, so it, it kind of closes the leaves. It keeps the moisture in the plant. But it only provides, each of these things only provide a degree or so of protection. So if we got 20 degrees, which is really freaky here, but it, I mean 25, you know, depending on what the citrus tree is, they... Uh, they can go down to certain levels, you know, like oranges and lemon, limes are, are more sensitive. Kumquats can go down to, in the teens before they'll die, so it just depends. You can have your soil professionally tested if you want, uh, and that's, that's always a, 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 good, um, a good thing to do. I haven't done that, um, uh, just truth. <laughs> I have been. Um, I have for many years. Well, and, and I've been in my particular home for over 20 years, so it, it, it's, it, yeah. But the thing about pH, they do have pH meters. You can buy um, little kits at, at the, um, Home Depot. anywhere, Home Depot, right, any of the nurseries. And, and then, and that'll give you kind of an idea of your pH. And, and usually you want to go around your yard, depending, soil, raised beds are a little different animal. If you're planting directly in the soil, uh, you, probably want a soil sample. But if you're planting directly in raised beds where you've added all the soil and you know what it is, uh, I, I mean, I think you probably don't have to worry about that. Yeah, but the, the pH, the thing that's interesting about pH is that for all the nutrients, uh, nutrient available, nutrients are available to plants uh, at certain pHs. For, for example, blueberries need a more acidic environment to grow. So uh, once or twice a year you would put some sulfur, you'd read the package, be sure to always follow the package directions. Put it around, scrape it in, uh, I also fertilize at that time, water it, 
mulch it. So they, so the nutrients that are in the soil already, if, if your pH isn't at where a blueberry wants it to be, it will not be able to access those, uh, those materials, those um, uh, chemical, chemicals. So, um, and your garden's the same way. Different plants like different pHs. Some like more acidic environments, tomatoes. Um, some like a little bit more alkaline, which is n not a lot, but I mean, we're just talking barely over neutral here. So I think in our, in our area, most of us are going to have pretty close to neutral pHs. So aside from those plants that, uh, that are obvious on your chart for, for uh, planting in the summer, or planting now or soon to get in for summer crops, um, I have some that I really like that aren't on that list. And um, one of them is New Zealand spinach. And I don't know if you've ever grown it or heard of it, but uh, once you have it, it'll come up. It's not invasive, but you'll get it and you can move it or you can eat it or let it grow. And what it is, it's, um, it's not a spinach, but it, the leaves are kind of triangular and they're a little succulent. So the, and they love hot weather. And when you pick the leaves and you cook them, the cooked vegetable is just like spinach. It's really good. I make spinach dip out of it or just serve it for dinner and um, it's excellent. Um, there also are heat tolerant lettuces. Uh, lettuce is a cool season crop, but you can grow it in the summer. And um, I've also grown cilantro all summer, but I also put shade cloth. We we're talking about this, not just for frost, but also for shade, um, put it over. You can grow certain kinds of lettuces and different Seed packages will tell you if they're heat tolerant, and that doesn't mean they like 115, like you. <laughs> but they, um, anyway, so we have some here that, were, that grow, they'll grow all season, um, but they'll also do okay in the, in the winter. A lot of the red uh, kind of lettuces are, are good. This one is, uh, what did we decide this was not? Oh, this is red sails. So, this is red sales lettuce. There's also um, some of the um, some of the romaine lettuces are more um, drought tolerant, uh, drought tolerant, but the heat tolerant. Uh, there's uh, some others. Black seeded Simpson. Uh, oak. Some of the oak leaves. They've got some. A lot of these things growing here throughout the winter. So, like I said, they can you can keep seeding them and, and get some new red fire red sales. Um, some of the some of the romaines like little gem which grows small it's it's a nice romaine i really like it it's uh, it's short and it grows pretty quick um, also there's a project out called and you may or may not have heard of it called the dwarf tomato project dwarf tomatoes are getting more popular dwarf tomatoes um, grow on a small plant and they produce regular sized fruit if if that's the fruit they're producing you can also get small ones but but the, the idea is that the plant itself is dwarf, so you can grow it in a container, um, you can grow it in your garden and it'll take up less space. You don't have to use these giant tomato cages and you know how they just go crazy. Um, there's a carrot that you can plant in autumn that overwinters, and a lot of them, I've grown a number of different carrots, and they'll overwinter and be ready in spring, late spring. Um, there's a yeah, peppers. I, we have really good luck with peppers. Um, they're not as sturdy as tomatoes. They do need support. Um, yeah, cucumbers. One, people have trouble with cucumbers because they have shallow roots and uh, they need consistent water or you're going to get something you don't really want to eat or the plant will die or they'll be stressed. And a lot of cucumbers uh, tend to get spider mites and you can tell by the leaves start to turn kind of yellowy and brittly and if you turn them over they have like little webbing on the back or little black dots where you know they're just diagnostic for that um, ha have you ever thought about growing corn if, if you if you grow corn corn is as we said earlier is wind pollinated so it's important to um, plant, plant it in a block so that as the pollen falls down it, it's it, one of the saddest things is to see somebody go uh, buy a six pack of corn and then plant a row. Basically what you're going to get is probably ear, you may get a couple of ears but they won't be they won't be full 
and uh, I think those are good if you want to decorate your porch for fall, but that's about all you're going to get out of it. Um, I highly recommend that you take pictures this year and uh, kind of keep a little log book. And a lot of times, for me, I'm not really great at writing a lot of things down, but if you take pictures and you say, oh, this is where this crop was last year, I'll rotate it and uh, with something else, and you forget where you planted it, this, it really helps. Uh, do that. The, uh, the last thing I wanted to just mention is um, fertilizers. So before you plant in the ground, um, put the fertilizer in, uh, work it in with some compost or whatever you're putting in your, in your vegetables in the ground or in the box, um, and plant the plant and then, you know, water it well. Fertilizer bags, I didn't bring uh, one, but you've probably all seen those fertilizer bags and they have the three little numbers on the front and they stand for nitri nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And each one of those helps the plant. Those are macronutrients. They're, plants, all plants need them. They also need micronutrients, but usually our soils are pretty, pretty good. I mean, we don't have a lot of deficit some. That's why if you get your soil tested, you'd know that. But um, so nitrogen, um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So. Nitrogen is for green, it's um, shoots, potassium, kind of generally uh, roots, and, and um, roots, shoots, and what's the other one? It's actually blossoms, but oh, fruits, fruits. <laughs> they, it rhymes, roots, <laughs> shoots, roots, and fruits. <laughs> but, but actually they have other things they do too, so, um, but, but I, um, a lot of things, because vegetables are heavy feeders, you're going to want to feed them throughout the season, you know, every couple of weeks, every month. But um, and then be sure to rotate, rotate your, I mean, you rotate your crops. Like plant, plant some lettuce now, and then plant some tomatoes. Like you can plant the tomatoes when it's time. And then uh, after your lettuce and everything is gone, maybe you still have tomatoes, or you can plant spinach because the temperature is right for germination and the and that's cooler season. I know there's a, a lettuce type they had in the box when I first came in over here. It's a new variety from Johnny's called um, Salanova, and it, it grows in a rosette. All the leaves are the same size, and I have grown. I have it growing right now in my yard. When you cut it off, um, it gets new. It gets new whole big heads that are coming off of it again. So yeah, I mean they're not big yet, but they're getting there. <laughs> so any uh, anything? Yeah, well, we're gonna cut it off there. Uh, and I'm here. Yeah, it, it, uh, I'm here. Just come over and oh, I wanted to tell you, we have freebies. Come up and get some green bean seeds. Come up and take a tomato plant. <laughs>